All right, we can get started. Um, there's a fellow with a San Francisco Giants hat over there. It's not allowed in my class. And there's a guy with a Dodgers cap behind you, so watch your back. <laughs> it's actually not that funny because there's been violence at both stadiums the last couple of years with this Dodgers Giants. Uh, yeah. OK, well, today we're going to finish the lectures before the midterm and leave 10 minutes at the end to talk about uh, whatever questions you have about lectures 1 through 10. So let's get straight to it. I had mentioned during the lecture on VDJ recombination that the process of junctional, that junctional diversity that occurs during VDJ joining uh, causes a problem in that two out of three times you end up with a nucleotides that make the, the, uh, the gene out of frame so you can't make a functional protein. In order for B cells to survive, you need a productive gene rearrangement at the heavy chain locus and the light chain locus. So if the chances of any one gene rearrangement being successful is one in three because the reading frames are, there's three, uh, codon, uh, three nucleotides per codon, uh, there has to be a mechanism to deal with this. But it doesn't always work and if you have something called a non-productive rearrangement at both the heavy chain loci, both chromosomes, or if you can't productively rearrange the light chains, the B cell will die. So B cells, de developing B cells are programmed to die by apoptosis if they cannot generate productive rearrangements that lead to an in-frame uh, joining leading to production of a, of, a, of a protein on the surface of the cell. So let's go sta stage by stage in B cell development. If you remember the earliest stage of a committed B cell is called the early pro B cell stage. And at this stage, you actually have both chromosomes for the heavy chain active undergoing D and J rearrangements. There's no screening at this point for productive rearrangements because no proteins are being produced anyway. That doesn't happen until the later stage. So all you need to know about the early pro B cell stage is that the D and the J, you get a D and J rearrangement on each chromosome. That allows you to transition to the late pro B cell stage and here uh, one of the chromosomes stops rearranging and the other chromosome you have a heavy chain rearrangement where a V segment is chosen to rearrange to the DJ segment. And two, there's two possible outcomes of that that can lead to a productive rearrangement that's in frame or a non-productive or sometimes written unproductive rearrangement. If you have an, an unproductive rearrangement or non-productive rearrangement, then you try to rearrange the second chromosome. That can also have two outcomes. It can rearrange productively or it can fail to rearrange productively. If either of the first or the second chromosome has a productive rearrangement, the cell receives a survival signal. But if you fail both times, the cell will die by apoptosis, which is the default uh, pathway. And overall, I won't go through the math, but you end up with about 50% of late pro B cells generating a productive heavy chain rearrangement and go on and survive and about 50% will die. Now it says in the notes that you can't do a further rearrangement if, the, if they don't work uh, because you've lost any the RSS sequences upstream of the D segment here and that what that means will become apparent later when we talk about uh, J segment rearrangements or VJ segment rearrangements in the light chain. Now the next stage of B cell development is called the large pre-B cell stage. And at this stage, because you've had a functional rearrangement of the heavy chain, you now have a heavy chain come to the surface of the cell. But no light chains have been, have been produced yet. And so in order for this to get to the surface, it, uh, it is accompanied by two proteins that together form what's called the surrogate light chain. And this surrogate light chain is composed of these proteins known as lambda 5 and V pre B. Two other proteins are also involved in stabilizing and the heavy chain and directing it to the cell surface and these are known as Ig alpha and beta and I believe I, I referred to them earlier on as they're involved in signal transduction. It's not clear from this diagram but they have much longer cytoplasmic tails and so they, they in, interact with intracellular proteins to direct uh, B cell signaling. There, in the notes it mentions that these are analogous to some other proteins in T cells. We haven't actually gotten to there yet, 
because we change the, I changed the order of the uh, lectures this year. So just hold off on that and we will talk, uh, and when, when we talk about T cell receptors and their signaling, uh, we will mention and come back to how these Ig alpha and beta chains work. Now, having the, this pre-B cell receptor, as it's called, with a heavy chain, surrogate light chain, and Ig alpha beta on the surface is really important because it sends a signal to the cell that a functional heavy chain has been produced. And that has two outcomes. One is that the cell is instructed to proliferate and divide like crazy, and you get about 100 daughter cells from one large pre-B cell that has a functional heavy chain on the surface. And the second is that it signals the cell to stop rearranging if there is another heavy chain locus. So if you go back to this slide, if the first rearrangement is successful and you have a heavy chain on the surface as part of the pre-B cell receptor, the signal allows it to survive, become a large pre-B cell, and prevents rearrangement of the second chromosome, the second allele. And that is the basis for the term that I defined a few lectures ago known as allelic exclusion. Now, signaling through the pre-B cell receptor involves a number of, of cytoplasmic proteins. One of them that's essential is known as BTK, and that stands for Bruton's tyrosine kinase after the Dr. Bruton who discovered it. And humans who lack BTK cannot make mature B cells or even immature B cells. They're stuck at this early uh, pro to pre-B cell transition. And they have a disease known as X-linked agammaglobulinemia. That's a, a long name, but you can abbreviate it XLA. It's a rare disease, but it, it's not that uncommon. And it's X-linked, so it occurs mainly in boys. And these boys have very few mature B cells. They make very little antibody, which is why it's called agammaglobulinemia, no gamma globulins, IgGs. So. You signal the cell to survive, you signal for allelic exclusion, and you signal for proliferation. And during, and now you have about 100 daughter cells from, from each cell uh, that has a functional heavy chain. Each of those will undergo light chain rearrangement in a separate and random fashion. So you can have on up to 100 or so different light, uh, B cell clones, each with the same heavy chain and different light chains. So let's just go back to a figure I showed last time, figure 6-4. Um, I don't think this is in the version that I posted on the website but, uh, of today's lecture. But it just reminds you, again, the early pro B cell is where DJ rearrangements occur. The late pro B cell, V to DJ rearrangements. Uh, if you get a functional heavy chain, then you reach the large pre B cell stage where you have a, this VDJ rearrangement. The light chain genes are not rearranged yet. The heavy chain is made. At the end of this proliferation process, you transition to the small pre B cell stage the pre-B cell receptor is no longer on the surface. The mu chain of the heavy chain is now found mainly in the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and that's in part because the surrogate light chains are no longer expressed. And it's at this stage that you have the light chain rearrangements occurring. So the small pre-B cell, it's just shown as pre-B cell here, but you can write in, if you want, small pre-B cell is where the light chain rearrangement occurs. And this also goes sequentially. Remember, there's two isotypes, kappa and lambda, and there's two alleles for each, and they're not all rearranging at the same time. You have go, go one chromosome at a time, and in general, the, one of the kappa loci rearranges first. And again, the outcomes are shown here by these plus minus diagrams. Uh, if the first rearrangement is successful and productive, you stop further rearrangements at other light chain loci and you express IgM with a kappa chain diagrammed here in green. If that is not successful, you try the other chromosome for kappa and that gives you a chance to make a kappa light chain. If neither of these is successful, then one of the lambda loci is used to try a rearrangement. If that works, then you make a lambda light chain. If that doesn't work, unproductive, then the second light uh, lambda light chain chromosome is used. Uh, and then you still have a chance to make a lambda light chain. If none of these work, then the cell will die by apoptosis. Now there's something different about light chain rearrangement, and that's shown in figure 6-9, which is that at each of those four loci, the two kappa and the two lambda, the arrangement allows you to make successive, successive attempts at, at rearrangement. 
So if the first one's not successful, you can try, try again. And that uh, is apparent if you look at the arrangement of the V segments and the J segments. In this example, V kappa 1 is the first one uh, selected to J kappa 2. If that's a non-functional or non-productive rearrangement so that no, it's out of frame and no light chain is produced, you still can use an upstream V kappa and a downstream J kappa to try a second time. A second VJ recombination occurs. If that was productive, you would make a, lamp, a kappa light chain and stop further rearrangements. But in this example, it's non-productive. You still have further upstream V kappas and one more downstream J kappa that you can try. So there's multiple chances to make a successful kappa or lambda rearrangement at each of these loci. Now, if it happens by random chance that at this locus you chose the first V kappa and the last J kappa as the first rearrangement, you couldn't do a second one because all of the intervening DNA would be lost. That does sometimes happen, but more often some uh, other V kappa and one of the other J kappas is, is chosen randomly first and so you have chance to use another one if you can't make a, a protein if you're out of frame. But overall, the presence of four instead of two loci, there's two for the heavy chain, but four for light chain. Uh, and this ability to do successive rearrangements means that light chain rearrangement almost always results in a, in a functional protein. And it's estimated that at least 85% of small pre-B cells are successful in making a light chain eventually. And the last thing to remember is that kappa and lambda isotypes have no functional differences. Uh, I mean, the, the actual, the, the regions, the CDR loops that are contributed will be slightly different, but in terms of their constant regions and ability to pair with IgM heavy chains or other isotypes, they have no functional differences. So they're equivalent. Uh, it doesn't matter which kappa locus or lambda locus you use. If you make a functional protein, it can work in an antibody. So coming back to this figure, you make a kappa light chain or a lambda light chain, now you have trans transitioned past the pre-B cell stage and you're what's known as an immature B cell. It sounds like you should be mature, but there, you still have a ways to go. This is the stage at which selection and removal of, of self-reactive cells occurs before you can become a mature B cell. At the immature B cell stage, you express IgM on the surface. You can see the blue heavy chains here. Uh, but very few of these will survive to become mature B cells because many will be self-reactive. Any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah, there's technically no difference, but you, but in, in humans you always have more kappa because they tend to rearrange first. There's some mammals where it's the reverse, there's more lambda, but all mammalian species that we've looked at uh, have two different light chain isotypes that are equivalent, and um, it probably just, it's important to have two so that you have a more chance to make m mature B cells without failing rearrangement. So let's talk for a minute about allelic exclusion. Why is it important? You understand the concept that you can only make one heavy chain, you can only make one light chain because once you get a heavy chain on the surface, you prevent further rearrangements. Once you get a light chain, you prevent further rearrangements. But why is it important? It's important because that leaves you with all the, the BCR on the surface, all the surface IG has a single specificity. Homogeneous B cell receptors with high avidity binding if you did not have allelic exclusion in this example here, let's say the, the cell's making two different heavy chains. They're not showing two different light chains, but just to make it simple, two different heavy chains. Some will have two of the blue ones, some will have two of the green ones, some will have one of each. When you encounter an antigen, half of the antibodies won't be able to bind at all. And, uh, or a third of them or so won't be able to bind at all, but some of them will, have, will be able to bind with one arm and not the other, so you don't get as high avidity, and only some of the BCR will have both arms engaged. So it's important that you have, each B cell has just one heavy chain and one light chain to increase the avidity of binding when you do encounter an antigen. So then the question is, how does this work? How does allelic exclusion work? Now you can go to figure 612, and this basically shows you 
all our favorite uh, stages here, early pro B, late pro B, et cetera, and a number of proteins down here, their function, and in orange, the stages at where they're expressed. So we're not going to talk about all of these. I'll just show you the ones we're interested in here. We'll start with RAG1 and RAG2. As you know, these are only expressed in developing B and T cells, so it's lymphoid-specific recombinase. But it's even more complicated than that because RAG1 and RAG2 are expressed early when you need to rearrange heavy chains and then turned off at the large pre-B cell stage. You can see, so that is, that's the mechanism for allelic exclusion. When the pre-B cell receptor is expressed, a signal is sent to the cell to shut off RAG1 and RAG2. If there's no RAG1 and RAG2, you can't rearrange the other locus. And it doesn't come back again until the small pre-B cell stage when it's time to uh, rearrange the light chain. Now you'll notice it stays on in the immature B cell stage and that will be important when we talk about selection later on. You'll notice other genes we've talked about that are expressed at different stages. So Ig alpha and beta come on really early. They need to be around to produce a pre-B cell receptor. The surrogate light chain proteins, v lambda 5 and V-pre-B, also come on at the same time as Ig alpha and beta, but they're turned off at the small pre-B cell stage, and now the new heavy chain goes back to inside the cell waiting for a real light chain to be produced. So that what we're left with is a system of checkpoints that's shown in, in figure 611. And there are two that you need to understand. These checkpoints are important to ensure that B cells survive only if a functional heavy and light chain are produced. At the early pro B cell stage is where there's commitment to this lineage. If you get heavy chain rearrangement, the, the surrogate light chain components can come to the surface as part of the pre-B cell receptor. And that allows the cell to survive, divide, and eventually undergo light chain rearrangement. If no heavy chain is produced because of unproductive rearrangements, the, the surrogate light chains stay uh, in the cytoplasm. There's no pre-B cell receptor produced, no survival signal, the cell dies by apoptosis. So this is the first checkpoint. It selects for functional heavy chains. Later, light chain rearrangement occurs. There's no more surrogate light chain. The heavy chain is just waiting for a real light chain. If a light chain is produced, a B cell receptor is, is made. Um, it would be nice if they color coded these with different light chains, but this is an IgM molecule with a kappa or lap lambda light chain and Ig alpha and beta here. That signals the cell to move on to immature B cell stage and undergo selection for self reactivity. If no light chains are produced, which is rare, but it, if it does happen, the heavy chains cannot come to the surface. You do not get that survival signal and the cell dies by apoptosis. So the second checkpoint selects for functional light chains. If you survive both of those, you have your immature B cell with IgM on the surface. And figure 616 really just summarizes everything we've seen already, putting it all together, and it's just something that you can use for your study. Any questions? So the question is how, the, how these get to the surface. Uh, so as with any proteins destined to be on the cell surface, they go through, they start in the ER, then they go to the Golgi, and then the trans-Golgi network, and then the, the vesicles that bring them to the surface. But for reasons that are too complicated to explain, uh, they're only, they only complete that process if all the components are there together, including the surrogate light chains here with a heavy chain or at this stage, the real light chains with a heavy chain and Ig alpha or beta. Any of them are missing. If you knock out surrogate light chains here or Ig alpha and beta, you don't get surface expression of the pre-B cell receptor or later the B cell receptor. Okay, so we'll take a short break today to talk about, talk about me, your teacher. Um, I often, used to hear from students that they were interested to know more about their professors. And so what is it that I've done that qualifies me to stand up here and tell you about immunology? Why am I being paid the big bucks to be a professor at UC Irvine? So I will tell you how I got here and a little bit about what we're doing now. <laughs> 
and I'll try not to take too much time away from the review session. I told you that BTK is required for B cell development and the humans that don't have BTK um, don't make B cells. So mice that don't have BTK also have a problem making B cells. And I became interested in, in, in B cell development as, as a graduate, as a postdoc working in a lab at Harvard. And the way I got into this is because the lab I was working at had identified and discovered an enzyme known as PI3K, which is highly active in cancer cells and in any dividing cell responding to growth factor. And the way it works is here's a growth factor receptor, no growth factor, no ligand around. PI3 kinase is this uh, dimeric protein, P85, P110. It's in the cytoplasm, nothing's happening. The ligand comes along, a growth factor, you get some phosphorylation events shown here as P. And now the P85 subunit uh, can be recruited to this receptor and this P110 subunit is an enzyme that converts a lipid in the membrane, PIP2, to something called PIP3. So it has three phosphates on an inositol uh, lipid. And that leads to recruitment of other proteins to the membrane uh, that can then transmit signals to the cell. And this is an evolutionarily conserved process. You find it in yeast. You find it in all um, eukaryotes. So it turns out one of, uh, there was some biochemical evidence that BTK was one of these effector proteins that is brought to the membrane in B cells when P3 kinase is activated. But it, it hadn't really been uh, studied in great detail. And I made uh, mice that lacked the P85 gene so they can't respond to ligand, in this case, antigen binding to a B cell receptor. And what we found was, and here's the paper, this is in, in the journal Science, that there was impaired B cell development and proliferation uh, and reduced antibodies. Uh, it's not in the title, but in the absence of this phosphonositide 3 kinase P85 alpha gene. And at the same time, in the same issue, a group from Japan um, found did a similar mouse knockout, and they found they, they showed that immunodeficiency was similar to a mouse known as XID mouse. And what does XID mean? X-linked immunodeficiency. These mice have mutations in BTK specifically in the region of BTK that's required for binding to PIP3. So it's all very complicated, but the bottom line is we provide a genetic link between PI3 kinase and BTK, and both were involved in a signaling pathway that's important both in mice and humans for making B cells. And later on, another group knocked out P110, a P110 gene, and they found very similar defects in B cells as well as T cells. Um, and then to my great um, satisfaction, or I guess I, I'm not happy that there's a human patient with this disease, but about 10 years later, um, our work in mice was validated by the finding of a human patient who has a mutation in the, in the human gene for P85, and they also don't have B cells and they can't make antibodies. So in the time since then, what we've been working on in my lab is just trying to understand more about the details of this pathway in normal B cells as well as leukemia cells and lymphoma cells. And I'm always happy to talk more about this outside of class time. Actually, I do want to say one more thing, which is that um, drugs targeting PI3 kinase were identified over the last 10 years. And a drug targeting this particular form of PI3 kinase was developed initially to try to treat um, antibody-mediated diseases by suppressing B cells. Turns out it's dramatically effective in, in tumors arising from B cells. So there's human patients who were near death with B cell lymphomas and leukemias who have been treated with inhibitors of this enzyme and are now living uh, fairly healthy lives. So that's another exciting aspect of this signaling pathway. Okay, back to reality and the, the uh, lecture here, what you need to learn for the midterm. Uh, this figure, 615, begins to tell you about classes of mature B cells. We're skipping ahead past selection of immature B cells. We'll come back to them in a few minutes. But I want to talk about the two general classes of mature B cells, and they're known as B1 cells and B2 cells. B1 cells are produced by a different, different developmental pathway and they're first produced early in fetal development. 
And you can identify them by the expression of a protein called CD5. It's not on this slide, but CD5 on, in both humans and mice is a marker for the B1 cell population. What's inter interesting about them also is that they're mainly found, the B1 cells are found in the peritoneal and pleural cavities, basically the gut and the lung cavities. Uh, whereas conventional cells, which is what we'll spend most of the time on in this class, circulate are found in blood and secondary lymphoid organs. And also they have a restricted junctional diversity and restricted V region repertoire. So they don't have, it's not really random which V segments that they use and they don't have nearly as much junctional diversity. So they seem to be kind of a evolutionarily conserved innate like B cell subset that is produced that has a limited uh, diversity but those specificities tend to be uh, useful in combating co commonly encountered pathogens that might be in the gut or the lung cavities. So we talk a lot in this class about innate immunity and adaptive immunity and B and T cells are part of adaptive immunity and everything else is part of innate immunity and dendritic cells are a bridge between the two. But it's increasingly apparent that within lymphocytes, B cells and T cells, there are specialized subsets that aren't quite so diverse in their V region repertoires or junctional diversity. They're not so diverse in where they're found in the body. They're, they're localized in certain areas. The first example is the B1 cell, and you'll hear about others later on. They're specialized subsets of B cells or T cells that are somewhat innate-like in that they, have a, they don't have an unlimited repertoire. And they're designed to fight specific commonly encountered pathogens, and they're only in certain locations in the body. So that's the concept I want to get across. This is the first of some other ones you'll learn about. It's an innate like lymphocyte. It's found in a specific place shown here. Restricted diversity compared to the conventional cells where it's very extensive and diverse. The other details uh, we won't talk about for this class, but the concept of an innate like B cell called a B1 cell uh, is what I wanted to get across. Any questions about that? Immunology is always more complicated than you think. I went to a, a immunology seminar last week that completely changed the way I think about a topic that we're going to talk about after the midterm. So uh, it's always changing. I think what's in the book now is, is valid up to a point, but it's fascinating what we don't know and what we're learning today. All right, so now we're going to deal with the challenge of self-reactive cells. And we'll, we have 10 minutes to do this before we get on to the review session. Now, I want to define a self-antigen first. A self-antigen is a normal component of your cells or your tissues or body fluids that can bind to the surface antigen receptor, in this case, the surface Ig on B cells. And you have hundreds, millions of these. Any surface of a, a cell protein, a carbohydrate, lipid, Anything that you can generate an antibody response to, if it's commonly normally found in your antibody, can be considered a self-antigen. Now there's two types of self-antigens that we will discuss in this lecture. The monovalent self-antigen, which basically has a single epitope that can be recognized by an antibody, or a multivalent self-antigen, uh, which has multiple epitopes. An example of a monovalent antigen might be a protein in plasma like albumin. On the albumin surface, there's only, if you have an antibody to albumin and it, it's only, you're only going to have one albumin molecule bound to one arm of the, of the antibody, you may have a, a second albumin molecule bound to the other arm, but only one epitope on each, as opposed to, let's say, the surface of a, a virus which would have multiple repeating epitopes and the, the same antibody is bound to um, multiple copies of that. A multi, and another example of a monovalent self-antigen might be from last lecture, IL-7. It's a cytokine secreted by bone marrow stromal cells. Uh, and it's a monomeric protein. If you have a, an antibody to it, it will bind to a single epitope on that self-antigen. What would be an example of a multivalent self-antigen? Well, 
An example would be a cell surface adhesion molecule on the bone marrow stromal cells, like the VCAM1 we talked about. There might be tens of thousands of VCAM1 molecules all on the surface. Uh, and so there, uh, a B cell encountering that will have many different chances, many different B cell receptors that can all stick to the surface it's interacting with and be clustered together. And as we go through the lecture, I think this will become more clear what I mean by monovalent versus multivalent an self antigens. So starting with figure 617, it just gives you the general concept for what happens when you have reaction with a self antigen. If there's no reaction, you have an immature B cell in the bone marrow. It does not detect any self reactivity. It will move to the blood and the spleen and start to recirculate. And at that point, it will express uh, IgD and IgM through alternative splicing and then go around looking for foreign antigens as a mature B cell. But now we're going to talk for a while about reaction with self antigen. If a B cell detects a self antigen, in this example it's on the surface of a bone marrow cell, but it could be a monovalent or, or soluble antigen, then you get retention of the immature B cell in the bone marrow uh, and it, the problem needs to be dealt with. One of the ways it's dealt with is just by apoptosis. So some immature B cells that encounter self antigen, particularly multivalent self antigen that causes a strong cross-linking response of all the receptors on the B cell, the immature B cell, it will just die by apoptosis. And that process is known as clonal deletion. But to save us from having so, much, so many B cells clonally deleted, there's a process known as receptor editing that gives you a chance to make a different antigen specificity and escape from death. And this occurs when you encounter a multivalent self antigen. So here's a bone marrow cell. Let's imagine this is VCAM1 or any other receptor that's on multiple copies on the bone marrow cell. And what happens is that multiple different IgM molecules will recognize those. They only show two here, but typically it might be tens or hundreds of them. And they'll all kind of cluster together on this surface of the immature B cell as it interacts with a bone marrow stromal cell. And that sends a, a strong signal to the cell to either die by clonal deletion or to do this process known as receptor editing. And receptor editing refers to going back to the light chain locus and trying successive rearrangements. So that, remember that during light chain rearrangement at the small pre-B cell stage, if you don't make a functional light chain, you can continue to rearrange the same locus. If you make a successful light chain but it's self-reactive with a heavy chain, then RAG1 and RAG2 are expressed again. I showed you before that RAG1 and RAG2 remain on at the immature B cell stage. Uh, and that's, that expression is preserved if you're self-reactive. And that allows additional V segments and J segments to be joined together. So immature B cell continues to rearrange light chain genes and now can make a new light chain and therefore the IgM has a different specificity. The heavy chain hasn't changed, but the light chain is slightly different now. Might have a different V segment, different J segment, different junctional diversity, and all that. Okay, so you have a different specificity. If the new receptor is not self-reactive, the B cell can leave the bone marrow just like the ones we saw earlier. If the new self -react receptor is still self-reactive, you can continue to rearrange light chain genes at that locus or at other ones that have not been used yet. So after receptor editing, you can sometimes use the second kappa or the, uh, the lambda light chains, uh, eventually leading to expression of a light chain uh, that, again, might be non-self-reactive and can leave the bone marrow. If it continues to happen, and no matter what you do, you're still self-reactive, and no further rearrangements are possible, then the immature B cell will undergo apoptosis, and you arrive at that outcome of clonal deletion. And it's thought that clonal deletion really only happens when you failed receptor editing. And because you have all these light chains uh, and successive rearrangements, receptor editing often can rescue the immature B cell from death. Of course, if the heavy chain contributes a lot of binding energy for the self antigen, it might not matter what light chain you produce, it may be inescapable from dying from reaction with the self antigen. <coughs> 
Does that make sense? What about a monovalent self-antigen? They call it a univalent self-antigen here. And it's useful to think about these as, as soluble proteins or other types of antigens that are basically all around the cell in three dimensions. So even if a lot of them are around, like albumin is very common in the blood and in the bone marrow, they, they're going to coat the surface of the, of the B cell by binding to all these B cell receptors, but they're never going to cluster any of the B cells in one place. That's different than if an immature B cell contacts it, a bone marrow stromal cell, all of the B cell receptors are going to sort of cluster at the surface of contact. That sends a strong signal to initiate receptor editing. If you have a soluble univalent self antigen, even if it's very abundant, you're just going to sort of coat the surface of the cell without any clustering. It produces a weak signal, not a very strong signal, and that is it causes a different outcome, which is known as energy. And the B cell is known as an anergic B cell, and it's basically the opposite of energy. It's a cell without energy, it's anergic. They're not deleted, they don't undergo receptor editing, and they actually can leave the bone marrow but they, and enter the per peripheral circulation, but they tend to die very quickly. So in the end, it has the same outcome as clonal deletion. You produce a short-lived B cell that eventually dies. Uh, and there's some other properties in that IgM expression goes way down on the surface, tends to be retained inside the cell, and you express IgD on the surface, but IgD doesn't signal very strongly. So energic B cells can survive for a little bit. They, they have different properties than, than regular mature B cells, but in the end, the outcome is the same as clonal deletion. Uh, you, this B cell that's self-reactive cannot survive and become part of the repertoire that fights infection. One last thing I want to say about this is, is the general concept in signal transduction that clustering of receptors produces a strong signal and just tickling of a little receptor here or there on the surface of the cell produces a weaker signal is, is very common and is is valid in a lot of the immunology that we'll talk about. We, we saw it already with phagocytosis. A lot of FC receptors have to engage IgG um, on the surface of a pathogen in order to produce a strong signal to lead to engulfment of the pathogen. So clustering of receptors is what's required to send a strong signal. So let's go back to this figure. What if you make an immature B cell that reacts with a protein or some antigen that's not found in the bone marrow? Let's say it's found in some specific tissue. It could be self-reactive, right? It's just not encountering its self-antigen at the time of, of uh, selection in the bone marrow. That is known as immunological ignorance. So you, you do have some self-reacted immature B cells and nothing happens to them in the bone marrow. And that could be because the self-antigen is not accessible during this education process or be because the affinity is so weak uh, that it doesn't produce a, a strong enough signal, whether multivalent or monovalent. Now it's important that you don't delete every B cell because you have to have some repertoire. So that's one reason why some potentially self-reactive B cells escape. But I also mentioned last time that there are additional mechanisms that preserve tolerance in the periphery known as peripheral tolerance. And one of them is that for a B cell to encounter antigen and then become a plasma cell or a memory cell, it needs help from T cells. So even if it encounters an antigen somewhere else that it wasn't in the bone marrow, uh, if there's no T cells to help it, it will essentially end up in the same place. It will undergo this process of energy and eventually die. And we'll learn about peripheral tolerance mechanisms later on. Nevertheless, the potentially self-reactive B cells that escape the bone marrow are, can be the seeds of autoimmunity later on. And in diseases like lupus and other antibody-driven autoimmune diseases, one of the most common types of antibodies are, are to double-stranded DNA or other nuclear antigens that are not found in the healthy bone marrow. 
where all the cells are alive and any dying cell is taken up by macrophages. Lupus patients uh, tend to have lots of nuclear material around because their cells have defects in apoptosis. Then you can get these anti-DNA and, and anti-RNA or ribonucleoprotein antibodies. This is outside the scope of today's lecture. But just tells you, just keep in mind that central tolerance in the bone marrow for B cells, in the thymus for T cells, eliminates most of your self-reactivity, but not all of it. And that is, that is why you have the potential for autoimmune disease later on. Okay, so uh, what if you, if you're ignorant or if there is no self-antigen and you come out, again, I just want to remind you, this cell is now called an amature B cell to distinguish from the immature B cell that, where selection occurs. B cell that's recirculating is a mature B cell. It expresses both IgM and IgD on the surface makes a single long mRNA and through use of different RNA processing mechanisms can the same mRNA that's produced can, uh, the same initial transcript that's produced can be spliced into forms that produce IgM heavy chains or IgG heavy chains. And until these encounter antigens, they're known as naive B cells. Okay, I have a few more slides that I've decided to skip and bring back in the, in the lecture that goes with chapter nine, part one, so that we can have some time to do a little review session here. Any questions about the, the last bit of, of today's lecture? Okay. So I have all my lectures here. I'll put them all on the desktop. Questions? Yes? Yeah, so how does chemokine binding lead to a change in affinity of LFA1? This, it's called inside out signaling. And uh, phosphorylation events and other processes lead to change in the, uh, the um, cytoskeletal proteins that position LFA1, and that changes its conformation so that it has high affinity for ICAM1. But we didn't talk about that, so ICAM1 ICAM does not. Yeah. Next. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so here we go. You will learn about this after the midterm, but just to let you know, um, if a, most of the time when a macrophage engulfs a bacteria, it can, it can degrade it, but there are certain macrophages or certain pathogens like tuberculosis that are perfectly happy living in the vesicles uh, and in the phagosomes and phagolysosomes. So what the helper T cell does by providing interferon gamma and other uh, cytokines, it makes a macrophage into a super killer macrophage that's e that does a better job of eradicating the intracellular or vesicular paras or pathogen. In the back. Okay, so we need to go to lecture seven, I believe. Because the antibody, the, <clears throat> the antigen binding surface is contributed by both the light chain and the heavy chain. So you're always going to, I mean, the V segments for heavy chain are different than the V segments for light chain. The, the, they're on different chromosomes, different V segments, different J segments. So by definition, the V, DJ, and J segments for the heavy chain will be different than the ones for the light chain. 
but the CDR 1, 2, and 3 loops of the heavy chain together with the CDR 1, 2, and 3 loops of the light chain are what produce the antigen binding site, which you see in lecture 6. In, uh, in pictures like this. So they have them color coded here. The red is the antigen, the yellow, green, blue, purple. These are the different CDR3 loops. And so, of course, the heavy and light chain are going to contribute separately to that. Does that answer the question? Well, in this, yeah, so remember though, you have this army of, of more than a billion different B cells and only a, a few of them will bind to a particular antigen and those are selected by the antigen to clonally expand. So the vast majority of the heavy and light chain pairs you make are not going to bind the antigen. So by definition, the B cell that responds has a heavy and light chain that have affinity for that antigen. The VDJ recombination is random. It occurs before antigen is encountered. The goal is to produce a diverse army of B cells and then those that are useful will be selected to expand. Yeah. The C region genes are all together on the same chromosome. So it's maybe on the next one. Yeah. Right. So the, the mu and delta exons are closest to VDJ. This is in the immature and mature cells. You get transcript to here. Uh, in the immature cells, only the only splicing event uh, that happens makes IgM. Mature cells make both IgM and IgD, but all the other constant region exons are available on the same chromosome later for class switch recombination, which is a completely different process than VDJ recombination. All right. Somebody else? Yeah. Could you explain the difference between monovalent and multivalent again? Okay. So a multivalent antigen is one that there are multiple copies of the epitope that are on the surface of a cell or on the surface of an extracellular matrix that are basically fixed in space in two dimensions almost. So that, yeah, this is a good question and a lot of, a lot of people get confused by this. So imagine a cell as a, as a round sphere and they're only showing, you know, four B cell receptors here, but there's tens of thousands of them on the surface of, let's say, a balloon. If the balloon bumps into another cell, the only, the, the multivalent antigens, let's say it's VCAM or some, something else on the stromal cell, all the B cell receptors will accumulate there at the end of the balloon or at the end of the sphere, and they'll all be right next to each other. Because there's multivalent, many copies of the epitope all right next to each other at kind of the surface where the B cell's touching, you get the congregation or clustering of those B cells, B cell receptors. If on the other hand it's monovalent, uh, there's only one epitope and there's multiple copies of the antigen but they're all in three dimensions like in, in the blood or in the lymph. So it's they're all around the cell, all around the balloon. Even if they're all covered all over the place and the B cell receptors are diffusing in the membrane, none of them are going to bump into each other and produce this clustering effect. So multivalent antigens by nature um, are, are all kind of together, fixed in space, and that leads to accumulation of the B cell receptors together at that contact point. Still have a couple minutes. Yep. Okay. No, you don't need to know the details of the hat medium for selecting, except that uh, myeloma cells can't survive in it and other cells can't. 
Anybody clustering on the cell surface of an immature B cell causes receptor editing. On the, anybody clustering on the surface of a mature B cell is, is important for activating the B cell. On an immature cell, at least apoptosis. There was one back there? Okay. Does IgM serve more of a purpose besides recognizing self antigens? Yes, on the mature B cell, it's important for recognizing foreign antigens. So does it undergo some kind of change in its signal when it becomes a mature, mature B cell? Yeah, the inside of the cell changes so that the same signal is interpreted differently. In the immature cell, it's interpreted as a death signal or a, re a receptor editing signal. In the mature cell, it's, it's interpreted by the cell as a proliferation and clonal expansion signal. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have a pathogen that gets into your bone marrow, will that cause clonal deletion and, and tolerance? Yes, but you should probably also already have some mature B cells elsewhere in the body that could be dealing with it. Okay, if you have other questions, I encourage you to use the message board. It's been underutilized. I'll keep an eye on it over the weekend. Uh, don't send me emails at 2 in the morning ask on Sunday night expecting an answer. I will see you here on Monday, and uh, good luck on the midterm. <laughs>